I'm Sean Kinney, and I'm joined today by Phil Olivero, who is the CTO for Light Tower. Phil, I really appreciate you taking some time to uh, speak with us today. No problem, Sean. Glad to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit about a wireless backhaul and some of the, uh, the trends in that space. But before we get into that, Phil, can you give the folks watching uh, an overview of Light Tower? Tell us a little bit about the company and what it does. Absolutely, Sean. So uh, Light Tower is an all fiber provider of high bandwidth services. Um, we've grown tremendously over the years, uh, both organically and inorganically, and actually the most recent inorganic transaction uh, occurred in August where uh, FiberTech was merged into Light Tower. Uh, it was a multi-billion dollar deal led by uh, Berkshire Partners, uh, our owners, or one of our primary owners anyway. Um, so our network is, uh, our fiber network, again, it's an all fiber network. Our network consists of over 30,000 route miles of fiber. Uh, we're connected to over 15,000 service locations, including you know, financial exchanges, data centers, stadiums, uh, media and content hubs, uh, critical landing stations, and over 5,000 cell sites as well. So, uh, so we've got a lot of endpoints in our network. Um, we offer a comprehensive suite of fiber-based solutions. Um, we serve over 3,500 customers uh, across a number of key uh, customer verticals. Uh, we've got financial services customers, healthcare, media, education, government, carrier, uh, so a whole host of verticals, uh, basically high bandwidth consumers. Um, and the specific customer services that we offer on this network uh, include lit connectivity solutions, basically from 10 meg to 100 gig, uh, and are delivered via wavelengths, ethernet, internet networks, and we also have custom private optical networks that we deliver, or design and deliver to customers as well. Um, so we, we offer these services, we have this network basically across the northeast of the US, down to the mid-Atlantic, I'm here down in Virginia, uh, we go as far as North Carolina, and we go across the, uh, the Midwest as well, out through Ohio, well, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Detroit, um, and up to Chicago and Indianapolis as well. So uh, really now with the combined network, a really broad network, a lot of fiber miles, a lot of uh, great high bandwidth services that we offer to customers in that geography. Yeah, well, all right, Phil. Well, thank you for telling us about Light Tower. Now, if we could talk a, a little bit more broadly about the industry, I mean, fiber is just red hot right now. And a lot of these infrastructure deployments are going to support things like small cells, like distributed antenna systems, as we see sort of this trend of bringing cellular into the building and providing that coverage where it's needed inside. So what does that mean for fiber providers when we talk about carriers like Sprint eyeing, you know, 50,000, 70,000 small cells? What do they need to support that from a fiber backhaul perspective? Man, that's a great question. So, you know, as you, as you know, and I'm sure many of our uh, watchers and viewers uh, know as well, so mobile data traffic is just uh, exploding. Um, you know, I saw a stat from a Cisco report that talked about monthly traffic. Monthly traffic uh, on the uh, on basically on these wireless networks is growing to 24 exabytes. Um, so that's a billion gigabytes uh, each month. Uh, and of course, what's driving that growth? I'm you know you have them, I have them, is those smartphones and all those applications that uh, that are driving increasingly video traffic, but certainly all kinds of traffic over those networks. Uh, and so you've got wireless carriers now who are challenged really to keep up with that, uh, that growth, that surge in demand, and provide a great customer experience for, uh, for customers who are trying to use all those great applications. So, you know, currently you've got uh, these wireless operators that uh, certainly work with us to be able to backhaul some of that traffic or all of that traffic really from, um, from those macro towers that they have that we see, you know, all around the, uh, uh, our, our landscape here. And uh, so that, you know, that certainly provides coverage and so on, but really with the surging demand, there are certainly pockets of capacity that, uh, that are needed to basically augment the network and make sure that, again, we're getting good performance as wireless uh, users, wireless uh, smartphone users. 
And so they're now starting to employ things like, as you mentioned, small cells, um, really asking for things like specifically asking for fiber-based backhaul. Uh, they're looking at uh, cloud radio access networks or sometimes called centralized radio access uh, networks as well to provide capacity where it's needed. So they have coverage. Now they need capacity uh, in certainly uh, some of the more dense areas where people are roaming around with lots of smartphones and downloading and or uploading lots of uh, information. So let me start with smart cells, uh, or small cells, sorry. Uh, they are becoming an integral part of wireless networks um, and are used to complement uh, the coverage again from the macro towers, providing incremental capacity to small geographic areas. So um, as you talked about, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, they're all uh, talking about how to implement small cells and the fact that they do want to implement thousands of small cells over the next few years. But there are really a number of challenges that must be overcome to ramp up deployment. They're certainly looking to folks like us to help them with that and others, by the way, as well. So first you have to understand, you know, at, at, at macro, at purpose-built macro towers, you've got a specialized uh, piece of real estate and specialized landowners that understand um, how to basically deal with these wireless operators. So, you know, wireless operators can easily secure space, uh, power, and uh, back also space and power certainly from the tower operators but then backhaul from folks like us who have fiber at or near those sites. So in macro towers, you know, a nice little ecosystem has evolved where they can get all those things fairly readily. In contrast, as much as uh, small cells are needed, um, when where they're installed and where they're needed is in places that aren't typically set up for easy, um, easy site acquisition. Uh, there aren't landlords that understand, you know, what it's going to take to uh, to hang an antenna. Um, there isn't necessarily ready power uh, nor backhaul because these are going on utility poles, they're going on sides of buildings and really non-traditional uh, locations for, for cell sites and so on. So to speed deployment, really wireless carriers are looking for folks to help them solve some of those problems that are solved at macro towers but aren't necessarily solved at small cell locations. And so they're looking to us and others for sometimes turnkey solutions, not just looking for the backhaul that we typically provide but they're now looking for site acquisition, power solutions, installation solutions, even maintenance sometimes of the equipment that exists on these non-traditional sites to really help them drive uh, small cell deployment. And we've done, you know, literally uh, thousands now of, uh, of deployments where we've helped uh, wire, wireless operators really start to deploy these, uh, these small cells in uh, en masse. And still, you know, it's still at the beginning of this rollout, but, um, but again, we're starting to uh, to find ways to deal with some of these challenges. So, Phil, when we talk about a, a really dense metropolitan network scenario where there is fiber that's connecting, you know, big financial buildings and and just you know downtown financial centers that are all connected to fiber, but then we we try to add in this next layer of complexity and bring small cells into the mix. What does it mean for a company like Light Tower if you have carrier clients or other clients that really want to site a small cell, but they don't have that ready access to fiber backhaul? It, does that mean that you, you lay more fiber and hope that the business case makes sense? Or do you look at maybe a, a more uh, workable solution with some give and take? That's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, clearly, um, you know, having a dense fiber footprint uh, makes it easier to get to that next building, whether it be an enterprise building or a building where a wireless operator wants to house or place a, a small cell. So the fact that um, you know fiber providers like ourselves are extremely dense already with fiber makes the, uh, the extension to the next small cell location or enterprise building that much easier. And frankly, um, it also helps the business case because as you extend that network, not only are you typically going to that small cell location or to that next enterprise building, but uh, we're also passing a number of other uh, buildings and opportunities that can help justify uh, the cost of extending that network. So, so really the, uh, the fact that you've got a dense fiber network or that we've got a dense fiber network actually helps us with not only um, you know, securing and making it uh, feasible to get to that next small cell location. But by doing so, it helps us get to that next enterprise building um, and that next, uh, you know, government location or carrier location. So that density actually uh, really helps us with, uh, again, being able to extend to locations that wireless operators need and other customers need as well. You know, another question I wanted to run by you, Phil, is, um, you know, I 
before we turned the recording on here, we were having a bit of a, a latency issue on the connection. So I went and hardwired my computer. And here in our office, we have a AT&T Gigapower fiber right to the office. And, uh, you know, they opened that up in Austin about two years ago. And it's just had this cascading effect. And, and now we've got Google, Google Fiber offering fiber to the home. We've got a Grande Communications offering fiber to the home. When they undertake these deployments to bring fiber from the, the trunk down to my house, are, are they dealing with companies like Light Tower to do this, or are they uh, laying their own new fiber networks to, to allow them to access residential facilities? Yeah, I think um, you know there are different carriers that have different approaches. So I think some of the, uh, the larger carriers, like some of the ones you mentioned there, are typically uh, 100% bill. Uh, but clearly, there are carriers that we work with that, um, you know, we have, again, that dense fiber network in these metropolitan areas. And residential customers is not the space that uh, original residential uh, consumers is not the space that we uh, we serve. And so we certainly partner with uh, with companies that can take our backbone network and extend it out to customers. So we certainly have partners like that. I think the, the examples you mentioned uh, are probably more in the uh, in the realm of building it themselves. But clearly, yes, our. Uh, our dense fiber footprint is, uh, is certainly not only useful for helping to get to enterprise buildings and cell sites and small cell sites, but certainly partners. Uh, we work with partners to get out to residential locations as well. So as we see more of that type of connection, more enterprise connections, and then we continue to add density as we work towards a, an ultimate sort of 5G network, what's the outlook for fiber deployments? And I, I, that's sort of a loaded question. I mean, from my perspective, it's an unlimited runway right now, right? Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, so our, our networks just keep getting more and more dense. Um, you know, as a company, we, uh, we not only, like I said, uh, grow inorganically, we grow, we spend a lot of money each year laying new fiber to new places um, and certainly densifying our existing markets, but also growing markets as well. So, so yeah, I think to your point, the, uh, the densification and the expansion of fiber networks is going to continue for a, a fair bit of time here. There's still a lot of buildings, a lot of places, as much as we have great density that we'd still like to get to and we will get to over the next few years as we continue to invest in the network. And I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we're seeing on the wireless side that, um, that I think will help um, drive their ability to meet the surging demand that we talked about before is that CRAN uh, technology I talked about before, cloud radio access networks. I mean, you've got now the wireless operators who, you know, I talked about small cells before. Um, you know, they, when they put a small cell on a building, right now you've got a typical uh, installation where you've got an antenna on the building. And you've also got a base station. That may be bigger or smaller, depending on if you're talking about a macro site or a small cell. But nonetheless, you've got a base, sta a base station and an antenna. With cloud radio access networks, you basically um, pull away and aggregate the base station. You still need the antenna. But the base station now uh, requirement at that small cell site moves away. And uh, the thing that allows that to be pulled apart and now makes the site acquisition process, the powering process at that small location, small cell location, it makes it much easier. It's much, you know, draws less power, needs less space and so on. So that's fantastic. The, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the wireless operators see that as a great way to speed up small cell deployment and so on. Well, the thing that makes all that possible is fiber. Because right now, again, at the base station, uh, the, the connection between the base station and the, uh, the antenna is a high bandwidth, typically coax, sometimes fiber connection, you know, literally from the top of the, uh, the pole down to the, uh, the ground where there's, a, uh, again, a base station complex there or compound. Um, the thing that allows that to be moved, uh, you know, farther away is, again, fiber. So now you're going to need not only fiber from, typically needed fiber backhaul from the base station back to mobile switching centers. Now you're going to need fiber front haul to connect the antenna to the base station and then from the base station back to the, uh, the Metropolitan Switching Center. So the demand for fiber, or at least the uses for both the demand and uses for fiber, will continue to go up. And, uh, and I think, you know, so there's certainly the, uh, the site acquisition and power benefits we talked about for wireless operators. The other benefit, of course, uh, or maybe not so obvious maybe, is as you centralize and aggregate those base stations, the other, um, and why it's called both cloud radio access networks and centralized radio access networks is, when you aggregate all those base stations, they start to use some of the virtualization and, uh, and basically the common server technologies you see in cloud. And so you don't need now discrete boxes for each base station. You actually put them on, again, very common uh, standardized server platforms. And now you can share and pool compute resources 
um, which can be more efficient. You can essentially uh, assign them to the antennas that are really seeing the demand when they're seeing the demand. Uh, so there's lots of applications that um, will become much more efficient as a result. And, uh, and again, not the least of which is the fact that the actual small cell site acquisition and power process, uh, power uh, you know, provisioning process will be so much simpler as well. And so to answer your question about the fiber, um, you know, the need for fiber and what, what this means over the next five years, I mean, there are applications like that that are coming up that will just make fiber even more important in the future. Yeah, that was a, you, that was a really lucid point you, you touched on there. I, I think our viewers, they've, they've heard it referred to as a base station pooling or, or base station hoteling, but we're basically, you know, we're co-locating equipment here in a centralized space. So, and and you, you, you got to it a, a lot, but just draw a straight line for us from co-location to OPEX and CAPEX. I mean, it just makes the whole process a lot easier. Absolutely. So, uh, so at Light Tower, we offer uh, co-location services as well. And, you know, traditionally, it's been for um, carriers or enterprise customers that are looking to centralize um, and, uh, and move off site some of their IT resources. So, you know, they've got servers in the basement and, uh, you know, they're running out of space and they got to keep up with the uh, redundant power requirements and heating and cooling and so on. And so classically, they've taken, or at least uh, typically now they've taken, um, instead of uh, taking that demand and, and fulfilling it themselves, they said, okay, let's move it to a place where it, it's, uh, it's handled by a carrier. It's, um, you know, uh, N plus one type uh, power redundancy and fantastic HVAC and, and cooling uh, resources that are not devoted to this. And so we've seen certainly that demand. We've seen uh, demand for customers that buy our dark fiber services and say, okay, I, I bought your dark fiber and along the way now I'm gonna have to put amplifiers and regens and so on. And they buy a co-location from us for that uh, purpose. But again, increasingly now, we're talking to wireless operators who are saying, okay, as I centralize now and think about centralizing my base stations, um, so great, uh, the front hall fiber is important to get. Uh, I need to get that from network service providers like, uh, like Light Tower. But I also need now a place where I can put that uh, centralized compute, those centralized base stations. And so now co-location, instead of needing, you think about uh, downtown Manhattan where you've got you know, thousands of cell sites, small and macro, um, that can now be centralized, maybe not into thousands of sites where you need thousands of leases for a wireless operator on buildings, or at least much smaller leases now for the base station equipment. You might need 10, 10 much larger complexes that again, you can really centralize the space needs, the power needs, the HVAC needs. So much more efficient uh, infrastructure and architecture really. And so I think it's, uh, it's gonna be critical for the wireless operators to find uh, partners that can provide again, that front hall fiber, back hall fiber, and ideally the co-location to put the whole package together to make some of these efficiencies happen. All right, so we, we touched on a lot of different uh, things in, in the conversation, Phil, but if you could distill it uh, for our viewers into the 2016, what's gonna be the trend to watch in terms of wireless backhaul? Yeah, I, I think for 2016, it's really small cell deployment. I mean, uh, you know, folks talk about, um, and the wireless operators certainly aren't gonna be putting in thousands upon thousands of macro cells. I think from a, from a coverage perspective, the coverage is mostly there. There'll certainly be some edge out um, coverage that, uh, that the wireless operators will look to, uh, look to do in 2016. But the number one issue that they're dealing with, especially now, is capacity. So capacity within their coverage areas and how to you know, pinpoint and place capacity where they need it. Certainly um, you know, in those macro towers, they're looking for more capacity and looking for us, frankly, to provide um, you know, the fiber-based backhaul solutions that we can because uh, they scale up rapidly. So the, the ability to say, hey, I want a 100 meg connection to this macro tower growing to 300, growing to 500, and it needs to happen, you know, quickly. Um, you know, fiber-based infrastructure allows that to happen. And that'll certainly happen. But I think the, uh, the story in 2016 will be uh, the continued growth of small cell deployments um, and the need for, again, you know, dealing with those challenges that I talked about, um, whether it be site act, power and of course uh, backhaul. All right, well very good Phil, we appreciate you going over those operative backhaul uh, issues with us and we look forward to seeing how uh, the small cell market demand plays out over 2016 and uh, Light Tower's role in that. Thank you very much for having me, Sean. 
HetNet Happenings is a production of RCR TV. To reach Sean Kinney or to suggest a show topic for HetNet Happenings, you can reach Sean at skinney at rcrwireless.com. On Twitter at Sean Kinney RCR. To find out more about the latest in HetNet and all things wireless, dig into rcrwireless.com.